Welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna take just another minute or two to let everybody connect to audio, switch over from their last Zoom meeting into their current Zoom meeting. Um, so you can take a minute just to get comfortable um, and then we will kick things off. Welcome everybody who's been joining. We're going to get started in just one more minute. Um, as I know folks are still, we still have a lot of people trickling in. So um, we'll give everybody a chance to join and get settled in before we get started today. All right, so we are going to go ahead and jump in because I want to give our speakers the maximum amount of time possible to share their knowledge and expertise. Welcome everybody to our webinar today, Sustainability for Medical Respite Programs, Strategies and Recommendations. Um, and I'm thrilled that we have our friends and partners in this work um, from Quantified Ventures, Susan and Chester, here to present their knowledge and expertise on the topic for us today. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of housekeeping reminders just before we get started. We did not set this up as a structured Zoom or webinar in Zoom, um, in part because we wanna be able to have people come off, uh, come on and speak and ask questions and engage in discussion at the end. That being said, we wanna remind you and ask you to make sure that you are muted, especially during the presentation part of this conversation. Um, so please just double check, make sure that you're muted for today so that we don't have disruptions in that. And then um, we will be doing a Q&A discussion portion at the end. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring that and making a list um, and bringing things up to start off the conversation once we get to that portion of today. So please feel free to ask questions throughout, um, but just note that we're gonna try to tackle as many as we can in the discussion part at the end. Before we jump into our presentation today, we do want to start um, with the practice of or doing a land and labor acknowledgement, which is in line with our, our council's values at the National Health Care the, for the Homeless Council to integrate land and labor acknowledgements into our forward facing presentations and conversations. Um, we are all from many different spaces. So today, the land and labor acknowledgement focus on, focuses on the headquarters of the National Health Care for the Homeless Council, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, and Quantified Ventures, which is in Washington, DC. Um, so I'm gonna read our acknowledgement here. I acknowledge, honor and acknowledge the original stewards of this occupied land. We stand on the unceded ancestral lands of the Cherokee who currently and historically reside in Tennessee and the Yuchi and Shanadasi Tula people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself. I also honor and acknowledge the original stewards of this occupied land of Washington, D.C., which stands on the unceded ancestral lands of the Nakotank and Piscataway people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people. We also acknowledge the labor of Black and African American people, ancestors, and descendants. We recognize the United States global economies historically and currently rest on the ingenuity, cultural treasures, and stolen labor of African American and Black people throughout the diaspora. We honor the brilliance think, and humanity of, of all immigrant labor, trafficked, forced, and undocumented peoples who contributed to the building of the country and continue to serve within our labor force. And we express our gratitude for their infinite contributions. By recognizing the land that was taken first from first Americans and the forced labor that was provided by enslaved people um, and Africans and brown people, we strive to take steps to create a more equitable and just world for all of us. Um, so thank you. So with that, I am going to stop sharing the screen.
And I'm gonna turn it over to Chester and Susan to um, lead us through our webinar today. Great, thanks Caitlin. Hi everyone, I'm Chester. I'm going to uh, give me one second here just to get my screen. Hold up. Okay. Are we all seeing my title screen? Yes. Great. All right. I'm seeing a thumbs up. Yeah. So I'm. We're going to start off today with just some quick introductions. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, Susan and I are from Quantified Ventures. So Quantified Ventures um, is a healthcare consulting firm, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on our overview. Um, based in Washington D.C. Uh, neither Susan uh, nor I are in Washington, D.C., though. I'm in Philadelphia and Susan's in Florida. Um, and we both work on our health and human services team. And so today throughout the presentation, we're going to um, tag team uh, various parts of this. Um, as Caitlin said, um, please, if, if possible, reserve questions for the end. We, have, we budgeted time at the end for question and answers, um, but also throughout the presentation, add questions into the chat um, as a way for us to uh, facilitate that Q&A at the end. So uh, today we're going to uh, walk through a couple different a couple different components of coming up with um, securing sustainable financing for your medical respite program. Um, we'll start off on just background on, on how to develop a viable revenue model. Um, then go into more tactics and strategies that could actually be um, implemented by your, by your program and close out with some real life case studies examples of what uh, Quantified Ventures has done in the past. Um, and just so you know, I'll shorten QV, uh, I'll shorten Quantified Ventures to say QV frequently. So just so you know the acronym I'm working in there. Um, okay, so... Uh, Quantified Ventures, as I mentioned, is a um, healthcare consulting firm based in D.C. We have two main practice areas that we work in. Uh, the first is environment and resilience, and the second is health and human services. And both of these practice areas, uh, we're really focused on developing um, partnerships and structure innovative financial transactions um, that better the health and social environmental impact um, to our clients that we can provide. Specifically with health and human services, um, we really partner with uh, providers, um, payers, and community-based organizations throughout the country um, to really address uh, the, the, the outcomes that those particular community-based organizations may be producing um, and find capital that would be able to fund those, those programs uh, for a long-term sustainable um, model. And so, sorry, I'm clicking my screen here. Uh, we do this throughout the country in a variety of different um, uh, different initiatives. And, and we can speak to um, work we've done around food insecurity, um, work that we've done around uh, family planning and maternal health. But I thought that obviously for this presentation it would make the most sense to highlight some of our medical respite and housing programs that we've done. And I don't think I'm going to read through every single uh, you know uh, bullet point on this slide here. Um, and we'll do some case studies uh, that reference some of these uh, that you're seeing now. But I think what's important to call out is kind of the the variety of different projects that we've worked on in the past, um, ranging from just Cal AIM and working with all of the ECM and CS uh, respite work in California to structuring some um, financing programs that would involve outside capital coming into Michigan that then partners with a payer um, to also just working with respite providers like yourself um, that just need help trying to figure some innovative financing pr processes out. Um, and so you will dive into more case study examples at the end, but this gives you a little flavor of some of the um, different programs that we've worked on in the past. I'm gonna pass to Susan now for uh, background and opportunity um, of what we see with, with developing our revenue models. Yeah, thanks Chester. And I'll, I'll say a couple more things, right? Like we, um, to Chester's point, we kind of show that breadth of experience in the housing space um, mostly to to emphasize that what we're going to talk about today can kind of feel abstract, right? Um, but 
we also have seen it work with different organizations um, and it looks different wherever, wherever we see it. Um, but uh, just want you all to know that there are um, kind of practical examples out there that we are happy to make connections with or share with folks um, more details of that to try to help bring some um, uh, more concreteness to what I, I know we know it at times can feel like an abstract concept. So um, just wanted to share that. Um, so some of this background, right, like is going to be stuff that, you know, is not new to this audience. These are problems that folks are familiar with or the reason probably folks decided to join today. Um, but we kind of share this background as a way to level set um, and to perhaps kind of help start thinking uh, about old problems in new ways. So um, kind of starting with, with this here, you know, the good news, right, is that medical respite is increasingly being recognized as a cost-effective intervention and has experienced significant growth in the past several years to the point now where there are 145 programs across 40 states. We've got replicable, uh, verifiable data from lots of different studies that demonstrate the potential for medical respite to have positive impact on um, improving uh, healthcare utilization, reducing avoidable ER visits, et cetera, and, cre and setting uh, participants on a positive course, both for their health and housing over the long term. Um, and that's being recognized across different states. We're, we're seeing 11 states that are reporting exploring Medicaid reimbursement for medical respite. Um, we There are two that um, QV is aware of and kind of actively working with that are currently providing reimbursement. So all of that is, you know, we see as very positive progress. And yet, um, when we still look at medical respite programs, again, um, you know, these are issues you all are very familiar with. There are very few medical respite for our providers that are reimbursed for all the services that they provide and have predictable reimbursement for uh, to cover the, the cost of providing their programs. There are some things that are reimbursable, more of the medical side um, treatments that may be provided either by the medical respite programs themselves or partners. There's a lot of unreimbursable services that, that are involved, um, room and board, housing navigation, the level of care management that this population requires um, is not, not traditionally a reimbursable service. And what we are seeing in these states that are starting to design reimbursement that's specifically targeted to support medical respite, what we're seeing is that the rates are still only so go only go so far to covering the costs of providing service in in these um in in these programs and i like right like just to pause on that for a little bit i used to say that i would love to get put out of business by states just waving their wand and saying medical respite food is medicine uh like comprehensive substance use treatment fully covered fully paid for um or at least put it on the put it on the um, the reimbursement schedule. I, I I increasingly, as we are seeing that happen, and that is undoubtedly a positive um, trend to have Medicaid reimbursement for things like medical respite and other health related social needs. We are also increasingly seeing and and increasingly believe that that is only going to be a part of the long term reimbursement picture for high quality programs and is unlikely to be um, the, the answer for, for programs. Um, so that, uh, you know, I think is positive and will remain a barrier. The other thing that, um, again, you all know this, that, that inhibits the growth of medical respite is the significant upfront capital. Um, we know that there are some programs that use excess, can use excess shelter beds, hotel beds, skilled nursing facilities, um, that allows the startup cost to be lower and quicker, um, recognizing that it's also challenging to operationalize best practices in those locations. And so, you know, often facilities and programs either start looking to start or expand um, are looking towards purpose-built or remodeled real estate, um, but that comes with significant cost and time delays. And um, 
without access to that kind of reliable sustainability, re sustainable revenue, revenue stream, there are very limited options for how to cover those upfront costs. So where that kind of puts you all um, is in a spot where programs are investing significant time and resource to attract revenue to launch and sustain services. And so what we see, and, and um, uh, Nymark has done a lot of really great work around this to understand the current funding sources for medical respite are very philanthropic in nature. A lot of foundation donation-based um, uh, funding, um, which is is great, um, but has challenges around predictability, um, and is also very expensive to um, to acquire. Right, like you all know this, the nonprofits, um, the like the, doing that and work of uh, uh, obtaining and managing grants and donations is is not free, and there's a real cost to that. And actually, when we look at it across nonprofits compared to corporations that are accessing traditional debt markets, there's you know it's as much as five to ten times higher cost for nonprofits to be accessing capital through grants as it is for corporations, um, you know, including their cost of debt and interest, et cetera. Um, so one of the things we want to do in this conversation is flip the script a little bit. I think the traditional way that kind of in the nonprofit sector, we, and I include myself in this, kind of looked at some of these issues is we have both the challenge around startup costs and sustainability. Let's figure out how to get a grant to help with the startup costs. And then we will uh, figure out sustainability after we're able to prove our value and uh, and get a program stood up. We will try to figure out and solve for sustainability. What we want to push on today and kind of just reorganize that and reframe that a little bit is to suggest that we could flip those and suggest that we could think about how do we solve for long-term sustainability um, as the first order question and what that does and what we see that do with, with the work that we've been able to, to do is that really actually helps make that first order or the, the, the upfront question of how do we finance growth? How do we finance and cover those upfront costs actually makes the solve for that much more straightforward. There are more options, whether they're debt based, um, and it is a you know very appealing um, uh, philanthropic proposition to say we have a long term solution. We just need help to get there. <clears throat> and so this conversation is really about how do we help solve for a viable revenue model that is able to unlock sustainability, access to capital, and, and enhanced impacts to be able to meet the need of the populations that you all are serving. Um, so we're gonna use the term earned revenue and an earned revenue model just to level set on what we mean by that. This is revenue that's being generated by community-based organizations through the sale of goods, services performed, uh, or work performed. So like think about the American Hospital Association does CPR classes, people are paying for that. Girl Scout cookies is another classic example of this. Um, that differs, right, from traditional philanthropic revenue um, that is providing full funding for a specific project or funding for a specific project, but it's often constrained by the funder priorities, frequently doesn't cover the full cost to implement the program that is meeting the needs as folks like yourselves on the ground are seeing it. And it lacks that path to scale, that there's not a built-in mechanism to be able to, once you demonstrate uh, impact and um, and viability, there isn't a built-in mechanism to continue to grow to meet that need. Um, so uh, as opposed to that, on the earned revenue side, um, really the, the benefits of using this approach are generating um, a, a new market uh, to provide more diversified and sustainable revenue to the organization. It then provides, like we were saying, that access to other alternative sources of funding and capital to support and cover both the upfront build and operations of a new program. The other good news for programs like Medical Respite and for you all is that there are a bunch of organizations um, out there 
uh, whether it is philanthropic uh, organizations with program related investment funds, whether it is uh, 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 conscious investors, ESG investors, um, uh, or other um, other CDFI type organizations that are really looking to provide um, incentives for these types of programs to get stood up. And so there's also the ability to um, to work with partners in that space to both access that capital and transfer some of the performance risk um, of new and innovative projects. Um, there are also um, uh, external accountability structures that this creates, right? So part of what's built into this, and you'll see as we talk through some of this, the way that this is designed is designed to create long-term business relationships between two organizations based on a mutual understanding of the value that's being created. And that really helps to extern uh, create that external accountability structure for long-term um, support. And then the last thing I'll say around this is when you are doing this work to uh, to create revenue streams around the value you're creating rather around rather than around the cost to provide a service, there's a potential for organizations like Medical Respite to generate margin when you're able to uh, uh, reach or exceed the performance um, expectations of, of the models that have been developed. So that creates margin that can be reinvested in your organization um, to expand your programs, to do other things, support um, those you serve in different ways. So a, a lot more flexibility than is traditionally baked into um, to models that that may be available. So that is kind of the background on earned like an earned revenue model. There are a lot of ways that nonprofits can explore earned revenue models. We are going to spend the rest of the conversation today focused on the approach that we think has a lot of and, and we know has potential in the medical respite space because we have used it in the medical respite space. And that is kind of our adaptation of value-based contracting um, uh, for medical respite specifically, and specifically for medical respite, but also for, you know, we use this approach, as Chester said, for any kind of health-related social need type model. So I will hand it off to Chester um, to walk us through that. Thanks, Susan. So as Susan said, we're going to talk a little bit more now about um, our our version of, of of an earned revenue model, which would be value based contracting, um, and so I'm sure uh, everyone's heard at some point of value based contracting, and um, but I think like going through what our unique um, our unique view of this and what Quantified Ventures looks at value based contracting uh, to mean is important to framing the next few slides here. Um, so there's three main components that we look at. Uh, the first would be these payments are indexed to the value of the expected outcomes. Um, and this goes a lot to what Susan just covered around the urine revenue. Um, so this is saying, what are those, uh, what are those, uh, th those outcomes that you're providing right now? Um, and how do we start to think about what the, um, what the payment would be associated with those particular outcomes that you're, that you're working to achieve? Um, the second part, the second component of value-based contracting for QV is uh, payments are fully or partially conditioned on the achievement of the pre-targeted outcomes. Um, and so by this, there's there's an element of how much risk your, your organization is willing to take on at any given time. And I think that's an important asterisk to put in there. That risk can change as your relationship with a possible payer changes down the road. So you could have a very low risk um, value-based contract put in place. Um, and as you will say, get more reps or get more practice, um, you know, developing that program and working with that payer, that risk can start to increase. And therefore also your payments start to increase. Um, and so that's where we then see those, those outcomes are start to become larger, but you also get a bigger reward from it. Um, and the third is this all sums up in this value-based financing idea um, that basically, or I'm sorry, outcomes-based financing idea that basically based on the outcomes that you're able to achieve as an organization, um, you can then, the payer would finance your, your program. 
Um, and so we'll walk through an example around how external capital could also be brought into this to help with the initial setup of that of that program to then be paid back based on the outcomes. Um, but there's a different flavors of how we can set up an outcomes based financing um, arrangement as well. So uh, I'm sure at this point, part of the question is going through your mind, um, maybe how am I thinking about approaching these payers now that I'm going down this value-based program or value-based contracting path? Um, and so we've separated this into two main groups of external and internal um, expectations. Uh, I want to, you know, I think both of these start to mesh together as we talk about them more, but we tried our best to try to, to separate here. Um, targeting first and external expectations is data and outcome tracking. Um, this should really be in some ways, like it could be just like the title of this slide. Um, it's, it's really an important part of the component before you're going to approach your payers. Um, and so working through what, uh, data you're able to collect, but more importantly, uh, what that data is that that is, is systematically happening throughout your entire system so that the person that's that's maybe inputting the data is inputting it the same way that the person that's reporting the data that's then the same person that is also analyzing the data for a payer. Um, and so if all three of them are looking at a different uh, naming convention for a particular outcome, it's going to cause all of your data and reporting to be all over the place. Um, and so I think one of the biggest uh, the biggest things that we can stress here is working through your data and outcome tracking. Um, second is a clearly defined program model and service model. Uh, as an example, we worked uh, for a new market entry in Ohio for a medical respite program. Uh, one of the first things that a payer said to us was, okay, well, we need a really clearly defined program model. And the respite program we were working with had a really defined program model, but it even needed to be tweaked even more just because of the way that that payer was looking at the model and wanted just more eyes on it in some ways. So I think having your defined program model is key here. Um, and also I know NIMARC has been super helpful in helping define what those program models look like. So this isn't a a huge check to, to have to check box here. Uh, second, or I'm sorry, third is implementation of the best practices that generate value. Um, this goes hand in hand, I think, with data and outcomes tracking. As long as you're implementing best practices that generate value, you're then providing outcomes and then getting those outcomes tracked in the correct way checks both of these boxes. Um, it's also how you make sure you have a clearly defined program that's able to, to generate value. Um, and the last is the ability to assess, to access um, consistent referrals. And I think an important uh, call out here is that those referrals are the right type of referrals that you're looking for from your organization. Um, and by that, I mean, who fits directly in that program model that you've been able to define? Are you being sure that you're able to get those referrals at a, at a pretty consistent base and therefore have that volume of, of patients uh, that are coming through? Um, and you know that then you're able to track those particular outcomes that are important to that payer based on those patients. Um, moving to internal expectations, uh, this is, you know, I'll, I'll go through these three bullet points, but I think to sum it up, there's a lot of just how do you get your business operations together to prep for approaching these payers? Um, and so this, this is really how are we thinking about the cash flow management and accounts receivable within your organization? metric tracking and performance monitoring and being able to report correctly on those metrics and performance. Um, and then the last one is this active risk management, openness, continuous improvement. This is kind of a teaser for the next slide, but um, you know, there's a lot of be flexible within your engagement with a possible payer. Um, payers are, are going to be asking for a million different things. Um, and so your ability to continuously improve and be flexible um, and shift your operations to adjust uh, is going to be a really important step to, to approaching your payers. Pastor, can I just emphasize something there too yep. before, before we move on is this idea of cash flow management and risk management is due to, right, there's a fundamental shift happening here when you move from a more like forward-looking grant philanthropic model um, to an earned revenue model, which is 
there is a component of this that you are providing service before you are getting full payments and you are taking on some performance risk that you will achieve the outcomes that you know you've demonstrated in the past, but there is some performance risk associated with that and active management that needs to happen. That is like, I we I don't want to underestimate or undersell the the how much of a transformation that can be depending on your existing um model if if we've got folks on the line from you know um uh fqhcs right like that may be more familiar to or fqhcs that are running medical respite that's how a lot of your business probably operates um but for standalone uh medical respites or for organizations that are more traditionally philanthropically funded that is a new muscle that would have to be developed in order to prepare for something like this. That's all, Chester. No, great point. Um so moving on to what are the what are the steps that you should be taking to advance with value-based contracting? Um so we tried to sum these up in in three main buckets as best as we could. Um I think an important note as I go through all of these um all of these steps are really looking are going to have to be owned by your organization. And that's not to say that a payer is not willing to collaborate and be a partner with you. Um, but what we have consistently seen in the past is that your organization would be the one having to spearhead all of this work um, to be able to come to a payer and work with them on, on, on developing what their uh, strategies are, what their outcomes would be, and then ultimately what their payment would possibly be to you. Um, so the first is the be curious section. So um, this is now, how are you researching and understanding um, what these outcomes that you're producing could translate to a benefit for your target payer? And so some examples to think through that um, would be what are new federal state uh policy that's being pushed out that might be relevant to a possible payer that you're going to approach? Um, what are the strategic priorities of a payer that you're going to approach? And how would that best align with your outcomes that you know that your organization is producing? Um, the second is own the math. So this is where we really get a little bit more into the cost benefit analysis that would have to be complete to say, um, my program is able to produce these type of uh, benefits to this particular payer. Um, we can see what our overall costs would be, where we would need the money to come from, um, how much we would need for all of those startup costs that we that we discussed earlier. Um, all of this financial projection uh, is a huge part and being able to also speak to every single aspect of it when you talk with your payer is just as an important part. Um, and then the third is this bucket that I hinted to in the previous slide, the, the be flexible. Um, as you're negotiating with a new payer, uh, there's going to be a lot of different changes and things that they may want you to tweak um, as through, through your conversations with them. Um, I think for a lot of payers, uh, while, while Susan at the beginning presented around the, the benefits of medical respite as a whole, for a lot of them, medical respite could be a brand new uh, program for them, something that maybe they've never heard of. So there's a lot of um, negoti negotiables that would have to be brought into your contracting process with them as you're thinking through and, and structuring that specific outcomes-based contract with them. Um, and so being flexible is just as important as a key component here. I'll tag on to um, Chester. Oh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. Yeah, um, just on the own the math part, right? Like. Um, I think our, our recommendations here are really about making it very practical and real. Um, it is not like, it should not be a academic exercise, right? It should be based on your research and kind of from the be curious phase is how do you get as close as possible to the realistic value to the organization that you're approaching of the outcomes you're producing. And that is often very different from, um, more generalized healthcare cost savings or whatever, right? Um, so that that's a big component. And then on the be flexible side, um, the uh, another big component of that is like know what your non-negotiables are, right? Like 
and know why, right? Because I think that's actually the first step in being able to be flexible. And when I have seen respite providers do this really well, um, they have both been as forceful in the in their flexibility as they are in when someone kind of touches a guardrail and right no, you do it in a polite way and right not in a combative way but it is very much like i that's that won't work for us we can't take full risk we um can't uh you know take you know have um have a model where the the referrals are going through um, an alternative organization, right? Like that just doesn't work for us. And I think that that's really important so that you are able to know where you can be flexible, um, but know where, where that flexibility ends. So. Um, next, we're going to go into two different case studies uh, that we have that I think We'll, we'll take this this framework of the be curious, own the math and be flexible and put it into some real life examples here. Uh, so I'll pass to Susan for, for our case studies. Yep, sorry about that, Chester. Um, probably gonna save that for now. Um, so yeah, so we'll talk about a few, uh, two case studies here. Um, the first is um, a program called Hope Has a Home in Washington, DC. This was a brand new 16 bed facility um, that was residential based. Um, that is a partnership between the Volunteers of America, Chesapeake, and Carolina um, as the primary operator of this program. Um, and uh, there, what started as a business relationship with AmeriHealth Caritas of DC, um, and uh, the original partnership with Ameritas, uh, AmeriHealth Caritas, um, helped in, um, started with a per diem rate. Um, that was, again, rooted in the value that AmeriHealth was seeing in potential outcomes to be created by this new program. So there was a, a per diem rate that was negotiated based on that shared understanding of value that actually, to start with here, was able to cover the cost of providing that medical respite service. Um, there was a, an initial component that was uh, had outcomes bonus payments that were based on achievement of inpatient utilization reduction and emergency department utilization reduction. That over time component of those outcomes payments is increasing as a portion of payments. And so there's a path for AmeriHealth to uh, both support the startup but then also over time shift their partner to have more and more of the payment tied to those outcomes measures. And that was a key part of being able to kind of engage with them and get them to uh, to engage with this type of model. Um, so that's kind of the value-based, kind of talked about those value-based components um, that and how they showed up in this case um, model specifically. Kind of thinking about those kind of be curious on the math, be flexible components here. On the be curious side, part of the initial conversations, what came to light was how important it was for medical respite payments to be counted on the medical side of the medical the medical loss ratio, MLR. Um, won't go into the nuance and detail of that, but that was something that wasn't obvious on day one and only came through deep conversation and um, and research and understanding of the partners at the table. On the own the math side, um, VOA really came to the table with a clear articulation and quantification of the value of those prioritized outcomes that was critical to kind of making the case. Um, and again, it was from a perspective of what the Medicaid plans had to gain. And then being flexible um, really had to create a shared staffing model that was able to maximize the existing Medicaid reimbursement, but also incentivize the critical partners that needed to be brought to the table um, that was able to kind of create this partnership. So that's Hope as a Home. Um, and then the second one we wanted to talk about today was uh, is some work in California. This is a case where their state, not mandated, that's actually probably strong, highly encouraged reimbursement for medical respite. They call it recuperative care. Um, but what we're seeing is that there are lots of um, communities where there the reimbursement that is being recommended um, at, from the state level 
is insufficient to attract medical respite providers um, in these communities and make it a viable proposition. Um, and so for from this perspective, we've been working with both a provider and a plan here. Um, and from the provider perspective, they were really um, open to understanding the needs of a new geography. This is an established organization um, in the southern part of the state that's moving into the northern part of the state. And so really being curious about that geography, how those market dynamics differ, um, and how the needs of the payers in that market differ from where they may have, where they currently were operating. Um, owning the math, again, um, you know, the, the provider here is a new facility, developed very clear and transparent projections of what it would cost to operate and what it would take for them to operationalize a best practice respite model um, and really had a, a deep, uh, uh, um, uh, deeply detailed analysis that was able to back up their, um, what they put forward as kind of their need to have daily rates to, to move forward. Um, and then being flexible, um, you know, there, this provider is expanding into a, a, a new geography um, and they were open to um, doing that, moving into that geography and expanding their footprint based on the needs of the medical payers, where that may not have been the the uh, geography that if it was just them as an organization, they may they may not have chosen. So um, that is the this um, California example. So I think just moving on to some. Um, kind of what's next here, um, and then would would love to open it up to questions. Um, going back to the beginning of this, we really see this value-based contracting approach as a way to accelerate medical respite across the country. And like, how does that happen, right? And our, what's our theory of the case, at least for how that happens, is using value-based contracting to design contractual relationships that align the interests and processes of medical respite providers and the payers that's creating that more diverse and sustainable revenue for, for respite providers. We also built into this because of the measurement that's inherent is it's building the evidence base for the value um, that's being delivered by these programs. And so, and, and helping to uh, support the identification of the specific practices that are um, helping to support those outcomes. And so hopefully through that, the idea is that there are more programs that are able to then deliver on the outcomes that are valuable to patients and partners alike. And then finally, we're really, again, the state payment and Medicaid reimbursement is only a piece of this. But I think the more that we engage with a broader cohort of plans, policymakers, investors to better understand this model, that really helps create more momentum um, for both payment and investment um, for medical respite that helps to accelerate that growth. <clears throat> so for you all as an organization, um, you know, where to start, right? If this is something that is, is of interest to explore, um, kind of Step one, thinking about some of those um, upfront expectations that Chester described earlier of, do you have a system in place to measure um, and monitor um, key performance metrics? Um, do you have a well-defined program structure that you can describe to an external audience in a way that they can understand? Do you have reliable access to referrals? Do you have efficient streamlined business operations and kind of that cash flow risk management approach? Um, there may be areas of those to be strengthened. I also want to say, like, it's a lot easier to say those things than to actually do them. So that's like real work that I'm sure is on the list and a priority for organizations regardless, right? Those are, are really big pieces of being prepared to do this. And if when and if those are um, in uh, in a solid place, then it becomes researching and evaluating possible payers, what's important to them, what's happening at the federal state level that they may be facing, starting to build network and kind of leverage existing relationships um, to just start to have conversations, to get closer to those organizations, have them know who you are, what you do, et cetera. Um, and then thinking through that cost benefit of analysis um, thinking about the outcomes that your organizations provide and kind of preparing for the contracting and reporting structures um, all kind of become pieces of that as well. Um, 
I think I'll stop there. I, I, um, and um, just to say, you know, we, <laughs> QB is a B Corp, like, which means that we have a dual kind of permission to, pers- to, uh, to support the mission of our organization in addition to kind of the financial f- side of, of what we do. And, you know, I, can speak for our whole team wholeheartedly when we take that mission component very seriously. And what we really want is for organizations like medical respite and those operating medical respite and, and, um, uh, organizations addressing health related social needs to be able to more sustainably, um, do the work that they do. And so, you know, we are here to help answer question, provide resource, as much as we can help be a catalyst and a cheerleader from the sideline for this work happening, we're happy to do that. Um, and so resources that we have available that we're happy to share um, if folks um, are interested in, in having a conversation about them um, around kind of sample payment measures that we've seen used before, um, prospective um, payer data request templates that help kind of um, inform pricing models that are that to be developed common questions and objections that we hear from prospective payers. Um, those are all things that we're happy to share and, um, you know, just happy to be a, a thought partner with folks as they're thinking about this, um, because we really, we really want to just see momentum build for this type of work um, and, and are want to play whatever part in supporting that that we can. So I'll pause there and I think we can open it up for questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, um, Susan and Chester. This was a lot of really great information. I'm going to do one quick plug. We do have another webinar in a week specifically focusing on managed care organizations. That registration, if you're not already registered, is in the chat. Um, And so there was one question that popped up, um, two questions really that that are relatively similar. And so I'll bring those up. I think we can start discussion there. Um, People are interested in hearing who the partner payers are, um, not just Medicaid MCOs, but integrated health systems, insurers, ACO, public health organizations. So if you could talk a little bit more about some of those options for partner payers. Yeah, I will say, and the reason that we have our next week's um, discussion specifically on MCOs is that is quite frankly the group we've had the most success with because there's a a more clear value proposition to their organization. There's also a lot of momentum at the federal and state level that is pushing Medicaid managed care towards making investments around health related social needs. So there's a really good alignment there. I think the other there are other types of um, organizations, um, where this could be a good fit. Um, hospitals and health systems are one that we continually explore. I think that's one where we see really needing to get in the nitty gritty of what's the financial implication for um, a hospital. You know, I think there's the obvious benefit of you are moving a individual who doesn't need to be in the hospital anymore out into the community earlier, and there should be a cost savings associated with that. But depending on what state you're in, what, um, how that, uh, if that state has expanded Medicaid or not expanded Medicaid, um, there's lots of different nuance that goes into that that complicates that picture. I think there's wholeheartedly a case to be made for it and that hospitals and health systems could be good partners. And we've seen that because we know hospitals and health systems do provide a lot of financial support for medical respite. Um, So I think there's a lot of untapped opportunity there um, that is, um, does take some weeding through um, that, that nuance um, uh, of, of, how how their how hospitals are impacted by medical respite. Yeah, and the, the one other thing I'll just quickly add to that too with ho- on the hospital piece is just we and and I've heard stories of this too where uh, hospitals are are clearly um pressed for funding right now as well. And so I think there's a there's also a a delicate conversation that's happening in just that 
realm um, and then factor in the medical respite piece of this, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge as well. Yeah, and somewhat related to that, this is a question that just came into the chat. Um, as a federally qualified health center, but I think this is relatable to a lot of respite programs, how can programs do more to own the math when the hospitalization, hospitalization costs and probably other costs are hidden from the programs themselves? And that question is in the chat too, if you need a visual. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, the where we have approached, the, the data is always gonna be imperfect, right? Um, and how we have approached that in the past is um, setting up the logic flow and essentially, right, like what does the math look like um, for, um, for cost savings projections? And that's where I alluded to like data request templates, right? We have basically said, here's the best we can do based on national figures, what we're able to pull from literature, et cetera, et cetera. We kind of build out that um, kind of straw man of a model and essentially say like, hey, like this is what the national data is telling us. We know we probably need to adapt it for the local environment, help us to uh, and provide us some data to help inform this. And then we'll use that to update the pricing. Sometimes, honestly, just the offer of like, hey, we'll update this for you to like make it more relevant locally is enough for people to be like, okay, cool. Like it's close enough, right? Um, and then sometimes we've had people take us up on that offer. Um, and, um, and so that's how like not letting perfect be the enemy of good and putting something out there as a starting point for the conversation and acknowledging that it is likely to be imperfect. Um, but it, I, we, st I, you know, I, I would still consider that I do still consider that owning the math because you are owning the logic flow, you are owning the calculations, and then you are looking to partner to supplement that and to make it better. But as an organization, you're still driving that process forward. Great. Um, and then a question that came in about the case studies of what percentage of the operating expenses do the value-based models cover? And then do these programs have other supplemental income or revenue re revenue sources? Yep. So Hope Has a Home, the original way that was set up, the per diem rate is covering their costs. And I should also say that started with just AmeriHealth um, and has now, they now have contracts with all of the Medicaid payers. And so they're kind of, the early phases of that are actually able to cover their full costs through those per diem rates. Um, um, in California, it's, you know, I think the, the recommended per diem rates are, you know, I think some of that is still like part of what we're trying to understand, quite frankly, but I think we're seeing anywhere from it's like 50 to 75 percent uh, that the recommended reimbursement rates are covering. And so outcomes payments are having to cover the rest of that gap. Um, and not to spoiler for next week, we're going to talk about an example in Detroit, um, which is another one that we're working with where it is uh, it is like at that 50% covered in per diem and 50% covered in outcomes. The thing I wanna, so it can really, it, de it, it depends on the partners and the situation. Um, what I will say is that the way that we think about it is that as an organization, if you are taking on more of the risk by having more of the payment in outcomes, that means that you should be eligible for higher, like you should be compensated for taking on that risk, right? And so we kind of use that as a negotiating tactic to say, okay, like you want to put more in outcomes, sure, but, and <laughs> um, what that means for the revenue potential for you as an organization should be going up. So um, that's the long-winded answer to, to that question. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think we have time for one last question, and I will uh, pull Barbara's that she just put into the chat here. So um, 
a little bit long. And I'll note for our attendees, I'm also going to launch the poll um, in the meantime while we're we're doing this last question. Um, but Barbara asked that the outcomes that many payers are looking for, discharge to housing, connections to community care, et cetera, are often out of the program's control. How can programs avoid being adversely impacted by reimbursements that are based on the availability of community services that they don't control? Yeah. So this, like, you guys, these are like the, the best questions. These are like the right questions. Um, um, so that, so a piece of that is come, it comes down to um, how you design those outcomes, right? And so that's a lot of what we spend time thinking about. And, and honestly, when we're involved, like a, acting as like a, a neutral broker of, um, of fairness in that, the outcomes have to reflect a balance of what is controllable by a respite program and what is meaningful for the outcomes payer. So, you know, talking about non-negotiables, one of my non-negotiables is like, I would never sign a medical respite program up for a shared savings model. Absolutely not. Like, and, but we have a lot of plans that are like, oh, I want to calculate the, sh the savings pre-post for the medical respite program. No, like non-starter, that's not going to work because there's too many, there's too much out of control for the respite program. Um, and then there are, right, like I, from the respite program perspective, there's a lot of, I think, process measures that would be um, more uh, controllable and appealing for respite um, that are probably not going to get close enough to value for the payers to, to make a difference. So it's about threading the needle. It's about finding that balance for the partners specifically. Um, and also recognizing that there is not an expectation when we when when you build this model, there should not be an expectation that you are being a hundred percent successful on any of these things. Um, in the best case scenario, are there are things that you've been tracking and you know, um, somewhat reliably, you are able to get someone into community-based care 50% of the time. You are able to get someone into a positive housing situation 20% of the time, and that gets baked into the model. Um, but, you know, that's that's really the right question and exactly where you should expect a lot of conversation um, to be around of what is that right balance? Thank you. Um, I'm sure we could probably have continued discussion for another <laughs> another hour alone. Um, but luckily, again, we have that upcoming um, webinar next week that's going to focus specifically on um, our, the managed care organizations, which I know is a kind of, again, a conversation all on its own. So before we wrapped up for today, I did want to just share a couple of resources that um, we have at the National Institute for Medical Respite Care, and to addition to the ones that Susan and Chester spoke about um, from Quantified Ventures. I know our resource page is very long at this point in time. So if you're having trouble finding any of these, please reach out to us um, for technical assistance. We're happy to support and provide that assistance there. Um, and then I just, again, wanted to plug our um, upcoming webinars um, activities that we have, um, both the, web the webinar that we have happening next week. Sorry, I'm trying to post and talk at the same time. And then we have an RCPN all member meeting coming up on November, uh, 29th. Um, and we're going to talk about hospital discharge practices, which is another really juicy discussion. So we hope to see you all at both of those conversations. Thank you so much for joining us today and everybody have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks everyone.